AM the Superstation WFDF uh, in Detroit every Sunday, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, but they had uh, some uh, special programming that preempted my show tonight. And I originally wanted to broadcast at uh, 9 p.m., my regular time. But it's been a very busy weekend, as many of you know. Uh, as many of you saw, I was in the Chicago area on uh, Friday, uh, September 6th. I was out in Pembroke Township, Illinois, for the State of the Black Race uh, Conference put on by the Black Awakening Movement. So I was speaking there and had to travel there and travel back to Detroit, so it threw my schedule off. But we're on live now, okay? So how's everybody doing tonight? Uh, everybody share this broadcast on your uh, Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in also. And then African-American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. So we know um, last week, Monday, was uh, Labor Day. And I wanted to deal with uh, some of the African-American roots of Labor Day and the origins of this Labor Day holiday. Uh, and deal with how this ties into the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porter, uh, Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, uh, and how that also ties into the modern day civil rights movement. So that's what we're going to deal with uh, tonight. All right. So how's everybody doing? Uh, we have Goddess Mother. Um, we have Offset watching. So everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Now, African American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. And we'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. Email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All right. And uh, on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's correct your own behavior, what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man's thoughts, you can control the circumference of his actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now, we deal with a number of different topics here on the show. We deal with current events, history, politics, uh, economics, entrepreneurship, uh, love, sex, health issues, education, relationships, and more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter. Okay. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter. And also visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can sign up for the email newsletter there as well. All right. We have Sis Ray Lay uh, joined us also. How's everybody doing? Sturge. All right. So um, people celebrate uh, Labor Day. And when we look at um, Labor Day, that also is the unofficial end to the summer uh, season. OK, but I want to deal with some of the history of uh, the Labor Day holiday and deal with uh, some of the African-American roots uh, dealing with uh, Labor Day also. All right. So. I talked about this back in September 2017 on Wake Up With Steve Hood, and I had my notes that I put together for that. And then uh, I had a, my computer crashed on me last year sometime, and I lost those notes. So I had to spend the majority of today putting all those notes back together, all that research uh, that I put. So I have 10 pages of notes here, okay? So get ready to take notes, all right? <laughs> so Labor Day is on Monday, September 2nd, 2019. Labor Day pays tribute to the contributions and achievements of American workers and is traditionally observed on the first Monday in September. Now, it was created by the labor movement of the late 19th century, the late 1800s, and became a federal holiday in 1894. It was signed into law as a federal holiday by President Grover Cleveland. Now, Labor Day weekend also symbolizes the end of summer, the unofficial end of summer for many Americans. And we know that children go back to school. Usually a lot of children go back to school that Tuesday, the day after Labor Day. And uh, Labor Day is often celebrated with parties, street parades and athletic events. Now, the labor movement, when we look at the origins of Labor Day, it comes out of the labor movement. OK, 
okay? The labor movement fought for fair wages and to improve working conditions, uh, as is well known, but it, but it was its political efforts that, that did nothing less than transform American society. Organized labor was critical in the fight against child labor and for the eight-hour uh, eight workday and the New Deal, the New Deal policies from uh, President Franklin Roosevelt passed by Congress during the 1930s and going into the 40s, including the GI Bill uh, of 1944. But it's the New Deal that gave us Social Security. The Social Security Administration uh, created in 1935 as part of the New Deal, unemployment insurance, um, the uh, minimum wage, comes out of the labor movement. The minimum wage was created in 1935 as part of, the, part of the New Deal as well. Union workers sacrificed in America's historic production effort in World War II and pushed for great uh, society legislation in the 1960s, okay? Going into um, things like um, uh, healthcare, Medicare, and Medicaid, all right? Uh, my Michael Trick is a former local machinist president from Galesburg, Illinois, um, cites his union support for Medicare and the Civil Rights Act, now celebrating its, uh, at the time, uh, one of these articles that I looked at uh, was written back, I think, 2017, celebrating his 50th anniversary as among his, his uh, local's proudest moments. Now, those shared victories came at a cost. Agitation for antitrust legislation, shorter work days and work weeks, and the right to organize was often portrayed as un-American and violently repressed. And oftentimes this was associated with being a socialist or being a communist, okay? Uh, having the unions organizing for fair wages, things like this, a lot of times they were demonized and associated with uh, communism or so socialism. Now, some of their leaders, some of the leaders of the uh, union movements uh, were socialists, but the whole union movement oftentimes was uh, mischaracterized as a socialist movement or sometimes a communist movement as a way to denigrate them. Okay. All right. How's everybody doing? Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, I'm going to post the information here about uh, tonight's broadcast as well. And then African American business owners, post the name of your business here in the thread of the broadcast. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. Email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. All right. So. Uh, the shared victories came at a cost, a a agitation for antitrust legislation, shorter work days and work weeks, and the right to organize was often portrayed as un-American and violently repressed. In 1914, John Kirby, president of the National Association of Manufactur Manufacturers, called the trade union movement, quote, an un-American, illegal, and infamous conspiracy, an un-American, illegal, and infamous conspiracy. Anti-labor uh, employers fought against what they saw as an incipient communism, uh, as incipient communi communism with strike breaking, blacklisting, vigilante violence, and by, enli and by enlisting government force to their side, and by enlisting government force to their side. During the Red Scare of 1919 and 1921, many states passed blanket sedition laws against radical speech and banned the flying of the red flag. So what you had was the union movement being associated oftentimes with communism. The union movement being looked at as something that's un-American. Violence being inflicted by uh, companies by corporations against workers who were striking for fair wages, striking for uh, better working conditions, safety, safe, safer working conditions, etc. Now, Labor Day began not as a national holiday, but in the streets of America, when on September 5th, 1882, thousands of bricklayers, printers, blacksmiths, railroad men, cigar makers, and others took a day off and marched in New York City. Eight hours for work, eight hours for work, eight hours for rest, eight hours for what we will, read one sign. 
Labor creates all wealth, read another sign. They're, so, so they're fighting for this eight hour a day work week because prior to um, the labor movement getting an eight hour a day week, um, in many factories they work 12 hours a day, sometimes more, okay? And you had children as young as six years old working in factories, oftentimes alongside their parents because you didn't have child labor laws, okay, at this time. So a placard in the following year's parade, 1883, read, we must crush the monopolies lest they crush us. We must crush the monopolies lest they crush us. Now the movement for the holiday grew city by city and eventually the state and federal authorities made it official. The Atlantic.com has a really good article dealing with some of the history of Labor Day called When Labor Day Meant Something, When Labor Day Meant Something. And it deals with the uh, origins of Labor Day and separates that from the uh, holiday of Labor Day as is celebrated oftentimes today with cookouts or uh, athletic events, things like this. Now, why do we celebrate Labor Day, okay? Labor Day is an annual celebration of workers and their achievements originated during one of American labor history's most dismal chapters. In the late 1800s, at the height of the Industrial Revolution in the United States, the average American worked 12-hour days and seven-day weeks in order to uh, eke out a basic living, in order just to make a basic living. They were working 12-hour days and seven days a week. Despite restrictions in some states, children as young as five or six years old uh, worked in schools, worked in factories and mines across the country, earning a fraction of their adult counterparts' wages because you don't have largely child labor laws at this time. Okay, all this deals with all these laws come out of policies, out of politics. These laws had to be put in place. This was legislation that was passed. Um, you know, I, I do a presentation called Six Principles of Political Self-Defense, How Laws and Policies Impact the Economic Conditions of African Americans. And when we understand politics, and I talked about this uh, this past Friday in Pembroke, Illinois, when I did my presentation on Six Principles of Political Self-Defense, and I, I deal with this on the Black Agenda Tour that I'm on with MeTX and Jice Johnson, uh, we will be in Orlando, I'm not Orlando, Oakland, Oakland, California, uh, October 12th, Columbus Day, actually, October 12th. So come out and discover something. Uh, visit the Black Agenda on tour.com for more information. The Black Agenda on tour.com for more information. But when we deal with uh, understanding politics and what politics is, politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, uh, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. The politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources. Um, and there and the, um, the politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of law, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. Politics impacts every aspect of our life. Eric, I'm having visual problems here. Uh, well, I'm not sure why you're having visual problems. What's wrong? Re try to refresh your screen, Erica. Okay. So let's continue here. All right, so you had to have legislation put in place to correct uh, these issues dealing with the labor movement, dealing, dealing, dealing with labor, okay? And you had to have regulations put in place. Now, people of all ages, particularly the very poor and recent immigrants, often face extremely unsafe working conditions with insufficient access to fresh air, sanitary facilities, and breaks because they're trying to, these are corporations, who are trying to oppress people and, 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 and extract uh, the most amount of profit that they can. So they're having unsanitary, unsafe working conditions, poor ventilation, exploiting child labor, exploiting the labor of immigrants coming to this country, exploiting the labor of African-Americans that were here and oftentimes paying African-American workers less money than they're paying their white counterparts for doing the same job. Now, after the Civil War ends in 1865, if we go back and look at some history, after the Civil War ends in 1865, you're going to have a lot of your large labor unions that are founded. 
we see the National Labor Union that was founded in 1866. Uh, this is so the, the Civil War ends officially uh, June 2nd, uh, 1865. We have the 13th Amendment of uh, December 1865, December 6, 1865, and it's ratified December 18th, 1865, the 13th Amendment. And this is what legally uh, frees uh, the enslaved Africans. And you, uh, there were at least 262 skills, trades, and crafts that African people had in this country from 1619 to 1865, okay? And uh, these, so these were all jobs that we're doing largely for free, all right? So in 1866, you're going to have the National Labor Union founded. Uh, you're going to have the American Federation of Labor that's founded sometime after that, around 1875, with Samuel Gompers, and we'll talk about Samuel Gompers, uh, G-O-M-P-E-R-S, in a few minutes here. Um, and they and and they uh, they were founded sometime after slavery, uh, as well as it was. Uh, so the, the enslaved Africans were doing the majority of the labor. We had the majority of the skills, the skills, trades, and crafts, okay? Um, and after slavery ends, now we can compete for wages, okay? So now that we can compete for wages, now they're creating these labor unions to protect these jobs for white men and white immigrants coming to this country, all right? Um, and then we're being locked out of these jobs, largely, and we're being locked into, especially in the South, locked back into agriculture, okay, with the sharecropping system. You're going to have the convict leasing system that's used from 1865 to 1928, but the sharecropping system actually did more damage and was really more widespread than the convict leasing system, contrary to popular belief, all right? So, uh, this is this is taking place after the Civil War ends, and this and we, we you have this taking place during Reconstruction, largely, especially the sharecropping system, uh, 1865 to 1877 is is uh, the Reconstruction era. Uh, Henry Louis Gates Jr., even though I disagree with him on some points of history, um, he did a I think it was a three part four part series on PBS recently called Reconstruction. So you can go to pbs.org and watch it there. Uh, and it may be on YouTube also, okay, but it has some good history dealing with uh, the Reconstruction era. All right, so what, what's going to happen is you're going to have African Americans who are, are locked out of these jobs that we were doing for free because of the unions, all right? And these various uh, labor unions are going to have contracts with different industries saying that you can only hire white men that belong to these unions. And then from about 1866 to 1880, uh, you're going to have about 12 million European immigrants that come to this country. And a lot of the jobs that they got should have gone to African Americans, uh, uh, should have gone to a lot of these former slaves, because we were here first and we were already doing the work. Our, our skill level was as good as most white people, and in many cases even better, because we were the ones who had been doing these jobs and had the skills and the trades from for 246 years, okay? Some of these skills we're gonna bring with us from Africa. Some of these skills uh, we're, going to, we're going to be taught here, all right? So you have uh, our labor being exploited, okay? And you're going to have um, uh, low wages being paid uh, to us, working in unsanitary conditions also. All right, now, if we look at the book, uh, How White Folks Got So Rich, The Untold Story of American White Supremacy, okay? How White Folks Got So Rich, The Untold Story of American White Supremacy, third edition, pages 37 through 38. And this is from the Nation of Islam Research Group. It um, deals with uh, the history of the labor movement, okay, and labor unions. And it talks about how um, it's well documented uh, it is very well documented that uh, about how the labor union movement of the late 1800s has arguably done more to destroy black progress than any other known action uh, of white people, yet it is almost totally invisible in the written histories of African American history, okay, or in the history of America. So this would be outside of slavery, the, the whole um, labor movement and how African Americans largely were locked out of the trade unions, 
locked out of the skilled trades after and uh, locked out of these jobs after the Civil War ends. OK, if we just look very quickly here, um, the book by James E. Newton and Ronald Lewis, The Other Slaves, Mechanics, Artisans and Craftsmen, uh, that came out in 1978. This book talks about, uh, it lists the 262 skills, trades, and crafts that African people had in this country from 1619 to 1865. Now, I knew about some of these, but I saw the full list at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. And when you go through their main exhibit called And Still We Rise, and they have a replica of a slave ship and you go through that and you go out on the other side and they, they take you throughout history. And then you see Frederick Douglass and you see a statue of Frederick Douglass, statue of Harriet Tubman. But there's a big display on the wall and it says a working life, American, uh, a working life, African-American occupations, a working life, African-American occupations. And it says those owned by skilled tradesmen learned their master's crafts and it has a directory of occupations held by blacks artisans and craftsmen prior to 1865 and the skills trades and crafts that they list came from the book the other slaves mechanics artisans and craftsmen that came out in 1978 um now some white people opposed teaching these skills, trades, and crafts to enslaved Africans because they said this provided competition for white people. And this is locking, this is pushing white people out of some of these jobs because the enslaved Africans were doing these jobs for free. And when you look at the Civil War and you look at the South fighting in the Civil War, majority of the men who fought on behalf of the South were not slave owners. Sure, General Robert E. Lee was of Virginia, General PGT Beauregard and Jefferson Davis in Mississippi. Yeah, they were slave owners. But the majority of the rank and file um, men who fought for the South, fought for the Confederacy, fighting to maintain slavery in the, in, in the Confederacy secedes from the Union, starting with uh, well, this, the, the Southern states secede from the Union starting December 20th, 1860 with South Carolina. The majority of these men were poor, poor white people, poor white men. So the question has to be asked, how did the wealthy, rich white plantation owners who owned slaves, how did they convince poor white men who majority of them didn't own slaves how did they convince them to go risk their lives and fight in the Civil War to maintain something most of them didn't have? Because when you study, when you read the statements of secession from these states, Texas, like um, Mississippi, Alabama, things like this, when you, Texas, when you read their statements of secession, they talk about how slavery was central to maintaining their wealth and their way of life. Well, most of, these, most of these poor white men fighting on behalf of the South don't own slaves. So how did the wealthy white slave owners convince the poor whites to go fight in the Civil War and risk their lives for, to maintain something most of them didn't have in the first place? What they told them was, if the slaves are free, the slaves are going to take your jobs they were too dumb to realize the slaves, the enslaved Africans were already doing their jobs and they were doing it for free. They were told if the enslaved Africans, 3.9 million slaves, if they're freed, they're going to take your jobs. They didn't realize the enslaved Africans were already doing their jobs and they were doing it for free. They were both being manipulated by the same people but they weren't smart enough to understand that. They were both being manipulated and oppressed by the same people, but they weren't smart enough to understand that. Because when you, when you go study the Freedmen's Bureau of 
the U.S. Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, the Freedmen's Bureau. The Freedmen's Bureau, during Reconstruction, they weren't just helping former slaves. They were helping poor, destitute white people as well. So if we look at, very quickly, some of the skills, trades, and crafts that African people had in this country from 1619 to 1865, we were anchor makers, we were artists, bakers, barkers, barrel makers, bartenders, basket makers, beer makers, blacksmiths, boarding house keepers, boat corkers, boatmen, bonnet press, book binders, boot blacks, which are shoe shine, those are shoe shine boys, shoe shine men, that's a boot black, brakesmen, brass founders, brewers, brickers, makers, bridal makers, brushers, butchers, makers, capstone workers, carpenters, carpet cleaners, carriage tremor, carriage tremors, carvers, caterers, caulkers, chain makers, chair makers, chimney sweepers, clergymen, clerks, cloak makers, cloth makers, clothes cleaners, clothiers, cigar makers, coachmen, coach painters, cobblers, coffin makers, collectors, confectioners, cooks, coopers, coppersmiths, cotton, men, cotton menders, cracker, cracker bakers, crafts instructors, Degora typers. Now, what's a Degora type? The Degora type was the first photo photographic camera named after John Degora type. It was invented in the mid to late 1820s, right around 1826. It became available for commercial usage in the 1830s. That's the first photographic camera called a Degora type named after its inventor, John Degora type. When you, when you see the famous picture of the black John Hansen, who people mistakenly think was a president under the Continental Congress, the first president under the Continental Congress from 1781 to 1782, there were two John Hansons. There was a Senator John Hansen of Maryland who was white, who was the first Continental Congress president from 1781 to 1782, and he dies in 1783. Then there was the black John Hansen who was the senator to Liberia. And the, the famous photograph that you see of him is a photograph, not a painting. Now, there are some paintings of him, but the, the famous depiction of him that we see is a Degora type. That is a photograph. That's circa, that's circa somewhere around 1852, 1856. It's on the Library of Congress website, because I know, because I went and researched all of this. It's on the Library of Congress website, okay? So when people think that the black John Hansen was president, that's a total misunderstanding of history. Because you're looking at a photograph that was taken with a camera that was invented about 40 years after the white John Hansen, who was the president of the Continental Congress, died. He died in 1783. You're dealing with two John Hansons. So, but you have, to, you have to understand a chronology of history and historical checkpoints to be able to distinguish between the two, to be able to decipher all of this. There were two John Hansons. The black John Hansen was not present, and he's not on the back of the $2 bill either. How do I know? Well, because I've seen the original painting that the $2 bill is a depiction of. Original painting was done by John Trumbull, an artist named John Trumbull. That was commissioned about 1817, okay? And when you look at the original painting, it's on Wikipedia. I've done research on this. You look at the original painting, it's in color. There's nobody of African descent on the back of the, on, on the original painting. When the, uh, but th there's one uh, senator who there's a shadow in the, in the painting. There's a shadow cast on his face. When the color painting is transferred or then redepicted on the back of the $2 bill, in the colors of white or shades of white and green, the shadow that's on one of the center, center's face gets darker. So people who then have not seen the original painting that the back of the $2 bill is actually a depiction of would then be misled by other people who haven't done research 
who then say, oh, that was John Hansen on the back. He was black. No, it wasn't. Go do some research, please. And I've written articles. I, got a, I have one video on, on my YouTube channel that I've done, Breaking This History Down. It's been viewed over 300,000 times. Go to uh, my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. Just search for John Hansen, H-A-N-S-O-N, J-A-H-A-N-S-O-N, and they'll come up with the video I've done. I'll go through, take you through our history, break this down, provide you the evidence. Proper documentation ends all conversation. And you can see the difference. You can research this for yourself. You don't have to believe a word that I say. Go research this for yourself, all right? <laughs> so we need to stop spreading these lies. This stuff is easily researchable, easily verifiable. Okay. All right. So we were the gore typers. We were decorative furnishers, distillers, domestics, draftsmen, draymen, dressmakers, druggist assistants, dyers, embroiderers, engine builders, engineers, engravers, finishers, fishermen, flower inspectors, fruiterers, furniture makers, gardeners, Garment cutters, garment cutters, general mechanics, glaziers. I guess they're doing, I guess they're glazing the um, wood or something like that. Glo glove makers, glove makers, gold pencil finishers, goldsmiths, gravers, gilders, hairdressers, hair workers, harness makers, hatters, hemp baggers hemp bag baggers h-e-m-p hemp baggers because hemp or cannabis was grown in many of the 13 colonies okay herb doctors horse shoers horse trainers house joiners j-o-i-n-e-r s house painters hunters ink Makers, I-N-K, ink, like ink and pens, ink makers, instrument makers, inventors, iron molders, iron smiths, blurs, keepers, knitters, laborers, ladies, shoemakers, ladies, shoemakers, lamp block makers, lamp lighters, launderers, leather carriers, leather carriers, leechers, Legal assistants, lime burners, L-I-M-E, lime burners, lime makers, lithographer, lithographers, locksmiths, live stable keepers, live stable keepers, locksmiths, locomotive mechanics, lumber merchants, machine blacksmiths, machinists, manufacturing chemist. Manufacturing chemists, map mounters, M-A-P, map mounters, mariners, masons, like brick masons, mast builders, like a mast on a ship, mast builders, mat makers, mat weavers, M-A-T, mattress makers, merchants, midwives, etc. We can also throw in wet nurses, okay? There were at least 262, now I've given you about 140. Okay, there are at least 262 skills, trades, and crafts that African people had in this country from 1619 up until 1865. All right, so how did I come across this? Now, I knew some of them already. Um, they, they mentioned some of them in um, the I Have All Three Editions of How White Folks Got So Rich the Untold Story of American White Supremacy. They mentioned a few of them in there, and I've read articles that talk about them, right? So I, I, I'm at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History back on July 7th, 2000, July 13th, July 13th, 2012. And I'm looking at this display, and um, there's a sign there that says you can't take pictures. So I go home, get a pen and pad, come back, and I spend an hour writing them all down, and I numbered them because they weren't numbered. I numbered them. That's how I know there were 202 of them. So I told some of the tour guides there that I knew because they didn't know how many there were. That's how I know it was 262, I should say. That's how I know there were 262 because I numbered them. 
after spending an hour writing them down, and I show this when I teach my online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. You know, I deal with, deal with some of this. And in a lot of my lectures, I um, show this to people. You know, this is, uh, this is a copy of it. The original is around here somewhere, but this is a copy of it. I don't even take the original at the house anymore, okay? This is a copy of it. This is the first, this is the first 147. The original is around here somewhere in one of my file folders, okay? It has the full 262. All right, so these are skills, trades, and crafts that we had in this country. But oftentimes, when the history of slavery is told, we were told that we just worked in the fields and picked cotton or cooked the master's food, things like that. No, that's 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 the um, that's the distorted history that they tell us uh, on the television. That's the distorted history. Oftentimes, they teach us in school. That's not the real history. So, if we look at pages thirty-seven to thirty-eight, actually thirty-seven through thirty-nine of how white folks got so rich, the untold story of American white supremacy, the third edition. I have, you could look at edition one and two, but the third edition, which is expanded. Um, they talk about the labor union movement of the late 1800s and how it has arguably done more to destroy black progress than any other known action of white people, yet it is almost totally invisible in the written histories of black America, okay? We'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in also. Uh, if you'd like this type of information, you can donate to the African History Network, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. That helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air. It helps me pay when I have to travel uh, to uh, speak at different events, things like this. Uh, I'm scheduled to speak at the... All Black National Convention, and it's going to be in Houston, Texas this year that uh, Dr. Boyce Watkins organizes. Uh, I'm speaking that Sunday, September 27th, I think it is. Um, also, you can order Hidden Colors 5 uh, at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, Hidden Colors 5, The Art of Black Warfare, from Director Tariq Nasheed. Each copy you purchase, you get three of, uh, of my lectures in digital download form, automatically free with it, that includes six principles of political self-defense that I did July 21st, 2019 at the um, Black Homeschooling Conference in Atlanta. So that's one of the presentations of mine that you'll get. So we, get, uh, we have Hidden Colors 5. Then also you can register for uh, the online course that I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Okay, this is an eight-week, 16-hour online course. We do a thousand years of history. We're going to meet uh, again uh, Monday. It's normally on Thursdays, but I couldn't do um, um, I couldn't do this past Thursday because I had to uh, I had to travel to Pembroke, Illinois. So uh, next class uh, we'll, we'll do Monday, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Okay, we do a thousands of years of history. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, article references. And uh, we deal with this uh, history chronologically as much as possible. And we deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. OK, so we do the classes live. Uh, all the sessions are recorded. So if you miss anything, you can go back and watch it over and over again. As soon as you register, you can watch classes one through three. There's also about 36 hours of bonus content for you to watch as well. OK, so it's regularly $130 on sale, $80. We just posted the link here. Is also on the homepage of our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. So register for that today. And your children can use it also. I would say it's PG-13, so 13 and up can um, use it. Uh, it's not, I don't curse a lot. It's not like that. It's, it's not vulgar, okay? But because we deal with the enslavement of African people, you know, we have to deal with some things that are, you know, unpleasant, okay? All right, so when we look at uh, page 37, of how white folks got so rich. Um, it talks about labor unions, racial cleansing of American labor, okay? And it talks about how the union movement was specifically designed to, to, to do two main things. One, remove African Americans from their jobs in the skilled trades, which they dominated, and two, to install in those jobs the European immigrants who were flooding into America by the millions, okay? But European immigrants, are being, their labor is being exploited. 
they're being put into jobs, they're being underpaid, they're being working 12 hour days, things like this. So we are both being exploited by the same people. Now, of course, African Americans are being exploited more because of the history of slavery, but we have to understand what white supremacy is and does. White supremacy pits groups of oppressed people against each other to fight one another so the 1% or 10% stays in power. So scholars attribute the rapid success of immigrant groups directly to the advantages they receive through their membership in the American trade unions. While historians have misrepresented African Americans in slavery as being more field hands or being mere field hands, African Americans held a virtual monopoly of almost all skilled and unskilled labor. Okay. And then they, um, they break down how we were the engineers, builders, tailors, shoemakers, carpenters, stonemasons, weavers, furniture and cabinet makers, plumbers, painters, sailors, boat makers, carriage makers, blacksmiths, printers, and every other type of skilled artisan. All right. That's on page 38. What I went through was more extensive, okay? But they lay this out. All right, so when we, um, so they go on to say that um, Southern writer Thomas Nelson Page, Southern writer Thomas Nelson Page said that after slavery, the black man was without a rival in the entire field of industrial labor throughout the South. 95% of all the industrial work of the Southern states was in his hands. 95% of all of the industrial work of the Southern states was in his hands and he was fully competent to do it. Every adult was either a skilled laborer or a trained mechanic. Now, uh, the uh, book goes on to say on page 39, they go on to say, indeed it was once said that if a white man were seen in public doing any form of skilled labor, he would draw a crowd of gawking onlookers. White immigrant laborers could not compete with the African-American worker, so the unions came to the rescue. The most powerful union leader in America was Samuel Gompers, G-O-M-P-E-R-S, Samuel Gompers, who led the American Federation of Labor, the AFL in its formative stages. Under Samuel Gomper, Gompers, the AFL systematically and violently carried out an occupational eviction of African-American workers, an occupational eviction of African-American workers. A common union expression was, quote, never let an N-word pick up a tool, end quote. A common union expression was, quote, never let an N-word pick up a tool, end quote. Samuel Gompers wrote, quote, Caucasian civilization will serve notice to blacks that its uplifting process is not to be interfered with in any way, end quote. Now, by the turn of the century, turn of the uh, 20, uh, going into the uh, 20th century, the early 1900s, by the turn, by the turn of the century, the black man, once the predominant worker in America, was locked in lowest wage labor or was totally jobless, was locked into the lowest wage labor or was totally jobless, forcing African-American women into the job market as farm workers, factory workers, and maids in white homes, domestics, okay? Now, we're going to have a lot of farms at this time. Uh, 1930, we have about 920,000 African-American owned farms. They're usually smaller farms than the white farms. The land that we got usually was not the, the best quality of land, but we at least we could grow food and grow crops. But the majority of African-Americans still, even though we own land, even though we own farms, the majority of us was still either poor living in poverty, okay? Now, the higher wages, of the unionized white male relieved white women of hard labor and provided them with the leisure, time, and financing for the development of art, literature, education, and culture. Union leaders staffed the licensing and professional certification boards and funneled all employment to Caucasian or, or white uh, male laborers 
while denying licenses and permits to African-American skilled craftsmen, craftsmen, further pushing African-American men back into dead-end low-wage work un, uh, under white authority. Okay. Um, AFL-CIO's uh, George Meany, M-E-A-N-Y, who was president from, uh, of the union from 1955 to 1979, once remarked, quote, it never occurred to me to have N-words in the union, end quote. It never occurred to me to have N words in the union. End quote. Now, by 1967, African Americans comprised just eight percent of construction trade unionists, and the plumbing, sheet metal, e electrical, uh, the plumbing, sheet metal, electrical, asbestos, and elevator trades had only 1,400 African American members out of a membership of 330,000. Okay, so I'm looking at page 40 and 41. Today, the weak and ineffectual anti-discrimination laws make it easy for the construction unions to evade compliance with anti-discrimination laws, just as their founding father Samuel Gompers intended. Today, the weak and ineffectual anti-discrimination laws make it easy for the construction unions to evade compliance with anti-discrimination laws, just as their founding father Samuel Gompers had intended. Next to slavery itself, America's labor union movement is history's perfect example of how a system can be designed to catapult the white race into a white people into prosperity while simultaneously destroying all options and avenues for African-American racial progress, okay, for those going into the skilled trades. Now, of course, yes, you're going to have African-Americans who are farmers. Yes, you're going to have um, cities like Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Everybody in Black Wall Street was not wealthy either. I've done a lot of research on that. I've done lectures dealing with the history of Black Wall Street. Yeah, you're going to have about think something like 27 millionaires, but you're going to have some poor people and you're going to have some domestics. You're going to have African-American women who worked in South Tulsa for white people because they were maids. All right. So you have a mixture in Tulsa. Yes. And, and, and Oklahoma, but especially Tulsa is going to get a big boom in the early 1900s because oil is discovered as well. So you're going to have all of that taking place. Now, uh, next to slavery itself, American labor union movements is history's perfect example of how a system can be designed to catapult um, white Americans into prosperity while sim simultaneously destroying all options and avenues for African American uh, progress. That is why Samuel Gompers' likeness has been carved into a gaudy statue in the center of Washington, D.C. for all to admire. OK. Um, OK, so check uh, check this out. Uh, pages thirty seven through forty one of uh, how white folks got so rich. The untold story of American white supremacy. OK, this is from um, uh, NOI uh, dot org. OK. All right. Let's continue here. Let me see where I left off. Okay, so when we look at the origins of Labor Day and we look at the origins, uh, if we look at the early history of labor unions, we're going to find that you're going to have a rise in them when you have the Industrial Revolution. And it's important to note that the Industrial Revolution starts in Great Britain in the 1790s, okay? Uh, and this is, and, 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 but this is uh, after they have largely gotten control of very of, of the natural resources of various African nations, okay? And of them extracting the natural resources of various African nations and other nations as well. We talk about India, things like this, other, other nations. But because they have an almost unlimited um, source of natural resources, especially coming from Africa, this allows the, them to get the raw materials for an industrial revolution to happen, okay? 
Uh, so it's important for people to understand uh, this connection. Where did they get the raw materials from? They didn't largely get the raw materials from the U.S. So when we study uh, the history of this, uh, we're going to see uh, the byproduct of the transatlantic slave trade. And oftentimes when we talk about it, we just talk about the human capital that was taken out of Africa, but we don't talk about the raw materials that were taken out of Africa as well that allows the Industrial Revolution to take place in the first place. So as manufacturing increasingly replaces an agricultural basis in the U.S., okay, um, you have a rise in American uh, uh, employment, you have a rise in uh, American uh, labor unions, which, and we, we first saw these labor unions appear in the 18th century, okay? In the late 1700s, we're going to see these first labor unions pop up, but they're going to become more popular after slavery ends. And but we're going to see uh, in, the set, in the late 1700s, we're going to see these small labor unions, okay? Then they're going to grow more prominent and more vocal because you have a replacing of an agricultural basis with a manufacturing basis in the U.S. And you have a rise of the Industrial Revolution uh, here in the U.S. in the 1800s, okay? So the labor unions began organizing strikes and rallies to protest poor conditions, poor working conditions, and, and, and poor pay, and they want to in, uh, renegotiate uh, for better wages, better working conditions. Now, many of these events turned violent. Many of these protests, things like this, turned violent during this period of time, including the infamous Haymarket uh, riot of 1886, in which several Chicago policemen and workers were killed. Others gave rise to long-standing traditions. On September 5th, 1882, 10,000 workers took unpaid time off to march from City Hall to Union Square in New York City, holding the first Labor Day parade in U.S. history. That was September 5th, 1882 in New York City. So the idea of a working man's holiday, the idea of a working man's holiday celebrated on the first Monday in September caught on in other industrial centers across the country. And many states passed legislation recognizing it. Congress would not legalize the holiday, however, until 12 years later in 1894, when a watershed moment in American labor history brought workers' rights squarely into uh, the public's view. What happened was on uh, May 11th, 1894, employers, um, in, in, so employees of the Pullman Palace Car Company in Chicago, the Pullman Palace Car Company in Chicago, went on strike to protest wage cuts and the firing of union representatives. Now, the Pullman Palace Car Company was named after George Pullman. And the Pullman Palace Car Company uh, in Chicago, uh, they, 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 uh, so you, what's going to happen is they went on strike in 1894, and this was after an economic a disaster, economic downturn that took place in 1893 called the Panic of 1893, okay? Um, George Pullman is going to have to cut wages, uh, cut wages by one third and cut back on union representation, okay? This caused a backlash. However, the African-American Pullman porters that we hear about, and there was a documentary on PBS a few years ago that dealt with the Pullman porters, maybe in about 2015, 2016, dealt with the history of the Pullman porters, okay? They were not allowed to join the white union, so they were not allowed to strike, okay? So this caused a backlash. However, uh, the African-American Pullman porters could not strike because they were not allowed to join the white union. They also had another, uh, the Pullman porters also had another set of grievances which dealt with, which dealt with their mistreatment and it dealt with racism, et cetera. Okay. Um, so when we look at the Pullman Palace Car Company strike that starts May 11, 1894, it began as unrest in, in, in the Illinois town founded by George Pullman. 
uh, called Pullman, Illinois. Okay, so George Pullman, I mean, this is a fascinating uh, piece of history dealing with George Pullman. He founds a town called Pullman, Illinois, that where his employees lived. Okay, now George M. Pullman, P U L L M A N, was born in 1831 in upstate New York. He was the son of a carpenter. He learned carpentry himself and moved to Chicago, Illinois in the late 1850s. During the Civil War, which was 1861 to 1865, he began building a new kind of railroad passenger car, which had, um, uh, it, it, so it had, it, it had a room, it had areas for passengers to sleep. These were the Pullman cars, okay? Now, Pullman cars became popular with the railroad railroads, and in 1867, George Pullman formed the Pullman Palace Car Company. He was the creator of the railroad sleeping car. Okay, so the town that he founded just outside of Chicago had been built as a utopian home for George Pullman's workers, his employees. But the utopia was designed to serve George Pullman above all others, according to PBS.org. PBS, PBS uh, Public Broadcasting System, they have a, they have a good article uh, dealing with this as well. PBS uh, NewsHour, The Origin of Labor Day, okay? From PBS NewsHour at PBS.org, The Origin of Labor Day from September 2nd, 2001. So the, um, the town that he created was more your uh, quote, its residents all worked for the Pullman company, their paychecks drawn from Pullman Bank, because he created a bank also. He founded a bank that was there in Pullman, Illinois. And their rent set by George Pullman deducted automatically from their weekly paychecks. Now, from 1880 to 1893, all seemed well in Pullman Town until an economic depression prompted George Pullman to cut employee, uh, his employees' wages, even though their rent, the, the, the amount they were paying for rent, stayed the same. So their wages were being cut by a third, but their rent was staying the same, and their wages were being automatically deducted from their paychecks. So the workers walked out. In solidarity, members of the American Railway Union, the American Railway Union, okay, founded by fiery socialist Eugene Debs, D-E-B-S, the American Railway Union took up the cause of the Pullman car workers and the 150,000 members of the American Railway Union refused to work on trains carrying George Pullman's cars. This prompted a nationwide transportation nightmare. You got 150,000 American Railway Union workers who are refusing to work on trains carrying George Pullman's cars. They're working in, in, they, they, they're working in solidarity. So in the early 1880s, as George Pullman's company prospered and his factories grew, George Pullman began planning a town to house his workers. The community of Pullman, Illinois was created according to his vision on the prairie on the outskirts of Chicago. In the new town, a grid of streets surrounded the factory. There were row houses for workers and foremen and engineers lived in larger houses. OK, the town also had banks, a hotel and a church. All were owned by George Pullman's company. A theater in the town put on plays, but they had to be productions that adhered to the strict moral standards set by George Pullman. The emphasis on morality was pervasive. George Pullman was determined to create an environment vastly different from the rough urban neighborhoods that he viewed as a major problem in America's rapidly industrializing society. So America is rapidly moving from a agricultural basis to an industrial basis. 
and you have people moving from the outskirts of the cities, moving from farmland into the inner cities where the factories are. Okay, so saloons, dance halls, and other establishments that have been frequented by working class Americans of the time were not allowed within the city limits of Pullman, Illinois. And it was widely believed that company spies kept a watchful eye on the workers during their hours off the job. The intrusiveness of management in the private lives of workers naturally became a source of resentment. So despite growing tension, tensions among his workers, George Pullman's vision of a paternalistic community organized around a factory fascinated the American public for a time. When Chicago hosted the Columbian Exposition, the World's Fair of 1893, international visitors flocked to see the model town created by George Pullman. So things changed in 1893 because of the Panic of 1893 and severe, uh, a severe financial depression that affected the, uh, affected the American economy. George Pullman has to cut uh, wages, uh, cut the uh, wages of his workers by one third, but he refused to lower the rent uh, rates uh, for the company housing. OK, so what was the Panic of 1893? The Depression set off by the Panic of 1893 was the greatest depression America had known and was uh, at that time. OK, it was only surpassed by the Great Depression of uh, 1929 going into the 1930s. In early May of 1893, the New York stock market dropped sharply. And in late June of 1893, panic selling caused the stock market to crash. A severe credit crisis resulted and more than 16,000 businesses had failed by the end of 1893. Okay, this is the panic of 1893. Included in the failed businesses were 156 railroads and nearly 500 banks. Unemployment spread until one in six American men lost their jobs. The depression inspired Coxey's uh, army, C-O-X-E-Y-S, C-O-X-E-Y apostrophe X, Coxey's army, a march on Washington of unemployed men. The protesters demanded that the government provide public works jobs. Their leader, Jacob Coxey, C-O-X-E-Y, was imprisoned for 20 days. The depression caused by the Panic of 1893 lasted for about four years, ending in 1897. Now, thought dot, thoughtco.com, thoughtco.com has a, a really good article dealing with financial panics of the 19th century, financial panics of the 19th century. And one of the ones they talk about is the Panic of 1893. So you can check out that article and do more research. Thought. T-O-H-U-G-H-T, thoughtco.com. So because of the Panic of 1893, and you have 156 railroads um, that, uh, that failed and nearly 500 banks, orders for railroad sleeping cars declined because George Pullman's company is manufacturing these railroad sleeping cars. Well, you got these railroads going out of business, so there's less demand for his sleeping cars. There's, so he has to cut back on wages, lay people off, things like this. Orders for railroad sleeping cars declined, and George Pullman was forced to lay off hundreds of employees. Those who remained endured wage cuts, even while rents in Pullman uh, remain consistent. Take home checks plummeted. And so the employees walked out demanding lower rents and higher pay. The American Railway Union, that I talked about a few minutes ago, led by socialist Eugene V. Debs, came to the cause of the striking workers and railroad workers across the nation boycotted trains carrying George Pullman's cars, rioting, pillaging, and burning of railroad cars soon ensued. Mobs of non-union workers joined in. In response, the American Railway Union, 
okay? Uh, okay, sir. So the, the, the local branches of the American Railway Union called for a strike uh, at the Pullman Car Company complex on May 11, 1894. Newspaper reports said the company was surprised by the men walking out, all right? So news of the Pullman strike spreads nationwide. Outraged by the strike at his factory, George Pullman closed the plant, determined to wait out the workers. George Pullman's stubborn strategy might have worked except the American Railway Union members called on the national membership to get involved. The union's national convention voted to refuse to work on any train in the country that had a Pullman car, which brought the nation's passenger rail service to a standstill. George Pullman had no power to crush a strike, which had suddenly spread far and wide. The American Railway Union managed to get about 260,000 workers nationwide to join in the boycott, okay? So not just their union members, but workers and people didn't even belong to their union. They, they got to join in. At times, Eugene V. Debs, the leader of the American Railway Union, was portrayed by the press as a dangerous, radical leading an insurrection against the American way of life. The strike instantly became a national issue. President Grover Cleveland faced with, with nervous railroad executives and interrupted mail trains, okay? Mail trains, trains delivering mail, all right? Declared, President Grover Cleveland declared the strike a federal crime and he deployed 12,000 troops, U.S. troops, to break the strike. This is President Grover Cleveland. Violence erupted and two men were killed when U.S. Deputy Marshals fired on protesters in Kensington, uh, Illinois, near Chicago, but the, strike was, but the strike was doomed. So on June 26, 1894, the American Railroad Union, led by Eugene V. Debs, called for a, uh, I'm sorry, so, I'm sorry, uh, we talked about that. Um, so, even to this, when we look at who created um, Labor Day, even to this day, we really don't know who created Labor Day, all right? What's going to happen is, because of this strike, because Grover Cleveland uh, sends in Union troops, this causes animosity between the unions and Grover Cleveland. So the creation of Labor Day was like an olive branch that Grover Cleveland was extending to them. In the wake of this massive unrest and in an attempt to repair ties with American workers, Congress passed an act making Labor Day a legal holiday in the District of Columbia and the territories. On June 28, 1894, President Grover Cleveland signed this bill into law. More than a century later, the true founder of Labor Day has yet to be identified. Many people credit Peter J. McGuire, who was the co-founder of the American Federation of Labor, the AFL, while others have suggested that Matthew McGuire, M -A so Peter J. McGuire is spelled M-C-G-U-I-R-E, okay? You have others who suggest that Matthew Mugwire, M-A-G-U-I-R-E, who was a secretary of the Central Labor Union, they, some people say he first proposed, proposed the holiday. Now, in an article from the Atlantic.com, Atlantic has a, um, a good article uh, dealing with uh, when Labor Day uh, meant something, okay? In an article from the Atlantic.com, they said that it was America's first true nationwide strike and a major milestone for the labor movement, but it did not end well for everyone. President Grover Cleveland, under pressure from the railroad industry and the U.S. Postal Service, because the U.S. Postal Service transported their mail on the railroad car, uh, railroad cars on the trains. They pleaded with Grover Cleveland to get involved in the strike, so he declared the strike a federal crime, and 
he, he and he sent in the Union troops to break it up, sending 12,000 Union troops. Now, it, uh, now, according to the Atlantic, it was America's first true nationwide strike and a major milestone for the labor movement, okay? And then you had, uh, let's see, David Ray Papke, P-A-P-K-E, who's the author of the book, The Pullman Case, P-U-L-L-M-A-N, The Pullman Case, describes the rioting and arson that ensued from this strike and was suppressed while death counts vary from, uh, from various sources, Time Magazine called it, quote, one of the bloodiest strikes in U.S. history, end quote. Okay. Now, while the strike came to an abrupt end and George Pullman employees promised never again to unionize. Okay. This is one of the outcomes. George Pullman's, um, uh, his employees uh, promised never again to unionize. Cleveland's popular, uh, uh, Gro President Grover Cleveland's popularity suffered, especially among the labor movement's working class core. Making Labor Day a national holiday was Grover Cleveland's election year attempt at an olive branch. And uh, PBS.org talks about this also in their article, The Origins of Labor Day. Although it did not succeed in winning him another term. All right. Now, Grover Cleveland serves two non-consecutive terms. President Grover Cleveland serves two non-consecutive terms. If we look at this, uh, if we look at this book here, how you doing, uh, Gertha uh, and Eugene? How y'all doing? If we look at this book here, Presidents: Every Question Answered. Okay, everything you can possibly want to know about the nation's chief executives. We look at this book here. It gives history on all of the presidents, okay? And if we look at uh, Grover Cleveland, okay, Stephen Grover Cleveland, he served two eighty five to 1889, okay? And then 1893 to 1897, all right? So 1894, you, you know, when the, when the strike takes place, he's, he's president. And if you look at, if you look at the cover of this book and you actually count from George Washington to Donald Trump, there have only been 44 U.S. presidents. Stephen Grover Cleveland served two non-consecutive terms as president, so he, gets, so he gets counted twice. This is why I don't call Trump 45, because there have only been 44 U.S. presidents. Okay? All right. So you go research that yourself also. All right, now let's continue. I told you I have a lot of information on this because I was pulling together all my notes and things like this and putting this all together in uh, one document. All right, now, uh, over time, however, as tensions e uh, eased between unions and the establishment, the holiday of Labor Day became uh, came less to uh, had had less to do with labor leaders and the history of labor unions, and it had more to do with retail figures, more to do with scouts, things like this, and it became more associated with the unofficial end of summer, more associated with oh okay, okay about the school things like this. Time Magazine has a good article entitled How a Bloody Railroad Strike Paved the Way for the First Labor Day. How a Bloody Railroad Strike Paved the Way for the First uh, Labor Day. All right. So when we look at the African-American Labor Day, we see this tying into the Pullman Porters. Okay. So we know in 1867, as I said before, Chicago industrialist George, George Pullman rev revolutionized rail travel with his famous Pullman cars, okay? Now, when a Pullman car was leased to a railroad, it was equipped with highly trained porters to serve the travelers. The cars were staffed with recently free enslaved Africans, okay? Because this is 1867 two years after slavery ends. So the cars were staffed with recently freed enslaved Africans, whom George Pullman judged to be skilled in service 
and willing to work for low wages. Skilled in service and willing to work for low wages. Soon, the Pullman Rail Car Company was the largest employer of African Americans in the country, with the greatest concentration of Pullman porters living on Chicago's South Side. Labor Day was nationally established after the Pullman strike of 1894, okay? The strike, however, did not include the African American Pullman porters or conductors on the trains, but for, um, because the African Americans were not, they, they were not allowed to join that white union, so they couldn't strike. But for the African American porters, racism fueled part of their dissatisfaction and their issues were, were not addressed at that time. Now, in their home neighborhoods, to be a Pullman porter was considered a prestigious position. The job offered a steady income, an opportunity to travel across America, and a life largely free of heavy physical labor, which was rare for African Americans in that era because most African Americans at that time were still had an agricultural basis. So either we were farmers, we own farms, or or we we or we're going to acquire land. Okay, um, and or, or we're sharecroppers. All right. Now, historian Tamuel Black, T I M U E L, historian Tamuel Black recounts, quote, there were good looking clean and they were good looking clean and immaculate in their dress their style was quite manly their language was very carefully crafted so that they had a sense of intelligence about them they were they were good role models for young men they were good role models for young men okay so he's talking about the pullman porters and i think they have on um on YouTube, I think they have the documentary dealing with the Pullman porters, okay, uh, that, that, that was shown on PBS. It was a really good documentary. I saw it uh, uh, a few years ago. So, uh, so check that out, and you can probably find that uh, on YouTube. Okay, and uh, just give me a second. I'm trying to send this out. All right. So how's everybody doing? And you can go ahead and post your questions here if you have any questions as well. All right, so if you like this type of information, you can donate to the African History Network, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. And let me check some here. We should still be broadcasting. All right. Okay. Gary, how you doing? Gary, Gertha, how you all doing? If you like this type of information, you can donate to the African History Network, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Also at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com. So you can uh, do a one-time donation or set up for a recurring donation. You can donate 10, 15, 25, 50, 100 dollars, what have you. That helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air. Um, helps pay when I have to help cover costs when I have to travel and pay the travel and uh, helps us pay the bills. Also um, all of my DVD lectures are available at our website, African history network.com African history network.com. And we have a uh, black since 1619, the 2019 six DVD bundle pack. Uh, also hidden colors five is available at our website, African history network.com. For each copy you purchase, you get three of my digital, you get three of my lectures in digital download format free, and you get them automatically. It includes uh, uh, my latest presentation, Six Principles of Political Self-Defense, How Laws and Policies uh, Impact the Economic Conditions of African Americans. That's just one of the presentations you'll get, all right? All right, so um, African American business owners, post name your business here on the thread of the broadcast. Email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. So a lot of people uh, want to get their financial house in the order. And certified financial planner Marticia Patterson can help you with that. Visit the website, PattersonPlans17.com, PattersonPlans17.com. 
www.sharonmartin17.com. Okay. She's helping people just like you focus on achieving your financial goals. If you need help with budgeting, saving for emergencies or retirement, if you want to start investing, but don't know where to stop, Marticia Patterson can help you with that. Okay. She will help you develop a plan tailored to your specific needs. You may have seen one of my recent interviews with her also. You can visit her website, Patterson Plans, the number 17.com, PattersonPlans17.com, or email her at Patterson plan 17 at gmail.com and let her know you found out about this from the African History Network. All right. Okay. And a lot of people are trying to get into shape. You know, summer is coming to an end, but we still want to look good. I've been working out. I've been losing weight. So, um, you know, I'm getting my sexy back also. But the Fast Life 28 Day Challenge can help you with this, all right? So the Fast Life 28 Day Challenge is an online coaching program to help members like you tap into their body's natural ability to repair itself via fasting. In this challenge, they focus on utilizing fasting, whole foods, and movement to improve metabolic conditions such as obesity, high blood pressure, prediabetes, type 2 diabetes, type 2 diabetes cholesterol and more you have three coaches that that will help you throughout this four-week program four-week 28-day program and they also have a facebook group to help you as well visit their website tfl28.com tfl28.com for more information and to sign up for their next group that they have starting up their next uh uh cohort uh, for the uh, four-week 28-day challenge, uh, tfl28.com for the Fast Life 28-day challenge. All right. How you doing, Susan? Okay. And then uh, we have our online course coming up, uh, class number four, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We're going to have a special session of that that uh, will meet Monday. Uh, it normally meets Thursdays, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, but we have a special session coming up uh, Monday, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, because this past Thursday, I had to head to uh, Chicago, and I couldn't I couldn't teach that class Thursday. So we have a special session coming up Monday, and then we'll, we'll do our regular class this Thursday also. So um, you all can register for that. All right, let's continue here. Okay, so now we're looking at the um, African American uh, roots of uh, Labor Day, and we're looking at the Pullman Porters. All right, so uh, historian Tamil Black recounts uh, about the Pullman Porters, and he said they were good-looking, clean, and immaculate in their dress. Their style was quite manly. Their ma their language was very. Uh, carefully crafted, so they had a sense of intelligence about them. They were good role models for young men, okay? They were good role models for young men. But the uh, Pullman porters were also mistreated. They were underpaid, overworked, and subjected to countless indignities on the job. And see, these were grievances that they had, right? Quote, a Pullman porter was really kind of a glorified hotel maid and bellhop in what George Pullman called a hotel on wheels, explains former Pullman porter and historian Greg Leroy. The Pullman company just thought of the porters as a piece of equipment, just like another button on a panel, the same as a light switch or a fan switch, end quote. But keep in mind, Pullman, George Pullman starts in 1867. He's hiring former slaves, okay? So he thinks of as lowly in the first place. He thinks of them as just, they should be just grateful for whatever they have, for whatever he's paying them. They should just be grateful for that, okay? Now, George Pullman demanded 400 hours a month or 11,000 miles sometimes as much as 20 hours at a stretch. And he paid ridiculously low wages. In 1926, 1926, so this is the year after the Brotherhood of Sleeping Carl Porter organizes, okay, E. Philip Randolph. In 1926, an average of $810 per year is what George Pullman paid in salary, okay? Now they're gonna make money from tips, 
but this is what he paid in salary, an average of $810 per year. This was about $7,500 in today's dollars. Uh, Lynn Hughes of the A. Philip Randolph Pullman Porter Museum said, quote, it did not pay a livable wage, but they made a living with the tips that they got because the salary was nothing, end quote. Now, the company expected its employees to pay for their own meals, supply their own uniforms and shoe polish, and allow them only short naps on couches in the smoking car. This gruntled Pullman Porters began to question their situation and decided to take on the enormously powerful company. In 1925, the Pullman Porters formed a union called the Brotherhood, Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. This marked the beginning of a 12-year struggle for dignity, better working conditions, and fair pay. Its leaders were charismatic African-American activist A. Philip Randolph and former porter Milton Webster, who was the head of the uh, Chicago uh, Union local. Their eventual triumph marked the first time in American history that an African-American African union forced a powerful corporation to the negotiating table. It was a significant step toward uh, it was a, a significant step forward for African-American equality. Now, the union members learned how to organize and negotiate. They discovered that even in a time of great prejudice in America, African-Americans could affect change if they stood together and persevered. Let me repeat this. Because of their experience, in the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, and because of their fight against the Pullman Car Company and George Pullman, they discovered that even in a time of great prejudice in America, African Americans could bring about change. They could affect change if they stood together and persevered. Now, they would later apply these techniques to the civil rights movement, the modern day civil rights movement. So we know that A. Philip Randolph is going to become instrumental in the modern day civil rights movement. And he was looked at as one of the big six Negro leaders uh, as well. So the union members of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters learned how to organize and negotiate. Okay. So we're going to see that um, the racism in the, uh, uh, members of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, they realized even at a time of racial prejudice and racism in, in America in the late 1920s and 30s, they realized that they could bring about change by working together and persevering. These tactics will later be applied to the civil rights movement, okay? So even though we look at the modern day civil rights movement as starting uh, December 5th, 1955 in Montgomery, Alabama with the Montgomery bus boycott, some people look at the beginning of the modern day civil rights movement uh, with the killing of Emmett Till, August 28th, 1955 in Money, Mississippi, and what took place afterwards, the trial, the fight to uh, gain evidence and to bring forward witnesses, things like this, right? So the trial and the support given to Emmett Till's family and the international attention of his, of his execution, this execution of an, a 14-year-old African-American boy. Um, his cousin, Simeon Wright, passed away in September 2017. So on uh, September, I think it was September 8th, 2017, on Wake Up With Steve Hood on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, uh, I did a segment dealing with uh, the African-American roots of Labor Day. And I talked about uh, Emmett Till's cousin, Simeon Wright, passing away, okay? So Simeon Wright was 74 years old when he died of bone cancer. And he was the cousin of Emmett Till, and he was there in the bedroom with Emmett Till the night of August 28th, 1955, okay? And going to that morning, that early morning, when the two white men, Roy Bryant and J.W. Mellum, came into his bedroom and kidnapped him, 
okay, and uh, took him out and killed him, all right? So Simeon Wright wrote a book in 2010 to uh, talk about Emmett Till and set the record straight, all right, about what actually happened. So the seeds of the civil rights movement, okay, the seeds of the modern day civil rights movement uh, were were planned going this th those seeds were planted going back to 1925 and in the 1930s now the root.com had a good article and a video clip from september 4th 2017 entitled america's racist history of labor america's racist history of labor and they talk about how america's racist history of labor um they, they deal with the uh, pullman porters in uh, a. Philip Randolph. Black Pullman porters were not allowed to participate in the Pullman strike of 1894, led by the American Railway Union, because they were uh, not allowed to join white white unions. But so, but African Americans are going to organize as well, and you're going to have African American unions before the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. Also, now some associate African American unions with A. Philip Randolph and the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, which was established in 1925. But some scholars date African American unions to as early as 1838. 1838, this is during slavery. And in 1869, four years after slavery ends, there was the Colored National Labor Union, the Colored National Labor Union, which was established by a ship caulker named Isaac Myers. Isaac Myers. Though the Colored National Labor Union was short-lived, it paved the way for other black unions to come, all right? So I want to go to this clip here. This is from, uh, this clip here is from uh, a video from the root.com dealing with America's uh, racist, uh, America's racist history of Labor Day, America's racist history of Labor Day. So let me turn up the volume and start this up. You should be able to hear this. Just a second here. Labor Day is a time to recognize the American labor movement. You know, the contributions that workers have made to this country. Newsflash, black labor built this country. After slaves were legally freed in 1865, black folks had a hell of a time finding employment, joining unions, and eventually the labor movement. Because yeah, history of labor in America is racist as food. Labor Day became a federal holiday in 1894 after a strike led by the American Railway Union, known as the Pullman Strike. This was a turning point in the labor movement, though it didn't benefit all American workers. Black Pullman porters weren't allowed to participate in the strike because they were not allowed in the union. But they wanted to be. Black people were organizing unions way back then, too. Some scholars even date black unions to as early as 1838. And in 1865, some African Americans were in white collar professions like doctors and lawyers, while some free men filled blue collar jobs like artisans, farm workers, laborers, servants, and caulkers. Speaking of ship caulkers, this is Isaac Myers. Born a free man in Baltimore in 1835, he started working as a ship caulker at 16. In the late 1850s, the white caulkers went on strike and even rioted against the well-unionized black caulkers, who were sometimes paid more than them because of collective bargaining with Baltimore shipyard owners. Ultimately, the shipyards fired about 1,000 black workers, including Myers. Isaac Myers and other African-American laborers organized the Black Run Cooperative Shipyard, the Chesapeake Marine Railway, and the Dry Dock Company. And they essentially employed themselves. Entrepreneurship, y'all. 300 black workers were employed through this cooperative. The shipyard was leased for 20 years, then it was returned to its owner. This success eventually led to one of the first national black labor organizations, the Colored National Labor Union. Myers became its first president in 1869. Their demands were simple, improve work conditions, eliminate discrimination within unions, and develop a national system of public education with equal opportunities for blacks. Over 200 delegates attended the first CNLU convention 
1869, and two representatives met with President Ulysses S. Grant. Frederick Douglass became their second president in 1872. But the CNLU soon dissolved after becoming divided over supporting the Republican Party or the National Labor Reform Party. Though the CNLU existed for less than five years, it led to the incorporation of black workers into white labor unions like the Knights of Labor. It also paved the way for black labor unions like the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. Established by A. Philip Randolph in 1925, this was the first African-American union to receive a charter in the American Federation of Labor, which later became the AFL-CIO. Randolph went on to become an outspoken leader in the civil rights movement. Finally, the work of black labor unions was recognized. Well, kind of, sort of. This is America, y'all. All right, so that was uh, from the root.com. And that was, uh, I think that was Felice Leon uh, from the root. But that deals, that deals with some background history. I'm going to give you some uh, more history here dealing with the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and also Isaac Myers, okay? And when they talked about the um, cooperative and cooperative economics, um, it's important to read this book here, Collective Courage, Collective Courage by Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard. You've heard me talk about it before, A History of African-American Cooperative Economic Thought and Practice. OK, because this deals with um, numerous examples of us using the co-ops in, in, in cooperative economics during slavery, reconstruction, after slavery ends, uh, et cetera. OK, we have a we have a rich history of um, cooperative economics, but we don't know this. OK, and we, we're operating based upon the co-ops. We're operating based upon principles that we brought with us uh, from Africa, okay? But a lot of people don't know this. So we try to use uh, white business principles, okay? And oftentimes that doesn't, largely that doesn't work for us. And I'm gonna see if they have uh, colored. I'm not sure if they have this in here. I want to see if you talked about Isaac Myers in here because I don't remember. But this is a good book to get. I interviewed uh, Dr. Jessica Gordon Nimhard a few years ago. Okay, I don't um, see Isaac Myers in here, but this is an excellent book. Okay, so if we look at, and that was a uh, Felice Leon also. Um, for um, the root.com uh, yeah check out the article uh, america's racist uh history of labor at the root.com america's racist history of labor at the root.com they have that video it's also on uh youtube and they have a uh, short article here so when we look at the history of the brotherhood of sleeping car porters right and a philip randolph um the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters was a labor union organized by African-American employees of the Pullman Company, Pullman uh, Car Company, in August of 1925, and led by A. Philip Randolph and Milton P. Webster, A. Philip Randolph and Mil Milton P. Webster. Over the next 12 years, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters fought a, fought a three-front battle against the Pullman Company. They fought for 12 years. Uh, so they, a three-front battle against the Pullman Company, the American Federation of Labor, and the anti-union, pro-Pullman sentiments of the majority of the community. The anti-union, pro-Pullman sentiments of the majority of the black community. So the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, they're fighting against George Pullman, and the Pullman Car Company. They're fighting against the American Federation of Labor, but they're also fighting against many African-Americans who are sympathetic to George Pullman and are anti-union. Now, largely successful on each front, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters is a significant institution, 
in both the labor and civil rights history of the 20th century United States. The BSCP faced long odds in 1925, despite its charismatic leadership. The union attracted only a small number of rank and file workers, and at no point before 1937 did it enroll a majority of porters. Most African-American leaders outside of the organization distrusted labor unions and moreover viewed George Pullman, whose company provided jobs, relatively high incomes in comparison to the incomes that most African-Americans were making, relatively high incomes, even though he was, they were, even though African-Americans were being paid, the, 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 the sleeping car porters, as you talked about, in 1920. Uh, six, they were making on average in salary $810 a year and had poor working conditions. But that was, that was something looked up to <laughs> at that period of time. Okay. So um, most African-American leaders outside of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters distrusted labor unions and moreover viewed George Pullman, whose company provided jobs relatively high incomes, and a modicum of services to African-American employees, they viewed him as an important ally of the African-American community, a reputation George Pullman assiduously exploited in his effort to undermine the union, to undermine the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. Meanwhile, while the American Federation of Labor granted federal local status to individual Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porter locals. It refused to charter the all black union as a full fledged international. Okay. So they granted federal local status to individual chapters, but refused to charter the all black national union as a full fledged international union. Now transforming his newspaper, the messenger into a propaganda vehicle for the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and tireless, tirelessly campaigning on behalf of the union, over time, A. Philip Randolph convinced African-American leaders, clergymen, and newspaper, and newspaper uh, editors that George Pullman's paternalism masked what was in fact a servile position for African-Americans within the company and a subtle recapitulation of the master-slave relationship. So what A. Philip Randolph is telling them is like, wait a second, he is exploiting, Pullman is exploiting the labor and conditions of African-Americans just as our labor was exploited on the plantations. These are plantations on wheels. This is what he's explaining to them. So in the process, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters became both a vehicle and a symbol of African-American advancement and according to one historian, helped facilitate the quote, rise of protest politics in black America, end quote the rise of protest politics in black America. Uh, Blackpast.org has a good article entitled Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, 1925 to 1978. Blackpast, P-A-S-T, blackpast.org. So read that, they go deeper into this history. So then we look at Isaac Myers, as, as we talked about briefly in the Colored National Labor Union, okay? So um, Isaac Myers, was a labor leader and Mason. He was born in Baltimore on January 13th, 1835. Isaac Myers, so this is during slavery. Isaac Myers was the son of free parents, but grew up in a slave state, Maryland, okay? Now, Isaac Myers received his early education from a private day school of a local clergyman named Rev uh, Reverend John Forty, F-O-R-T-I-E. Since the state of Maryland provided no public education for African-American children at the time. At age 16, 
he became an apprentice to James Jackson, who was a prominent African-American Baltimore ship caulker, C-A-U-L-K-E-R. Four years later, Isaac Myers was supervising the caulking of clipper ships operating out of Baltimore. During the Civil War of 1861-1865, Isaac Myers worked as a porter and shipping clerk for a grocer, a grocery store owner, and then returned to his original profession as a caulker. Soon after the war ended, Isaac Myers found himself unexpectedly unemployed when a group of white caulkers protested of African-American caulkers and Longs and Long Hort, Longs Horman. I mean, sorry, uh, Longshoremen, I should say, Longshoremen, okay? So you have, once again, you have these unions being formed after the Civil War ends. They're trying to protect these jobs for white men and push African-Americans out of these jobs and out of these skills tra skilled trades. So in response to the strike, Isaac Myers proposed the creation of a union for African-American caulkers. The newly created union called the Colored Caulkers Trade Union Society, the Colored Caulkers Trade Union Society, decided to form a cooperative company, co-op, cooperative company that would own a shipyard and railroad, pooling their resources. The workers issued stock and quickly raised $10,000 in subscriptions among African-American Baltimore residents. They also borrowed another $30,000, and on February 12, 1866, just one year after the Civil War ends, and not actually, not even a full year after the Civil War ends, February 12, 1866, they purchased a shipyard and railway when, which they named the Chesapeake, the Chesapeake Marine Railway and Dry Dock Company, the Chesapeake Marine Railway and Dry Dock Company. With, within months, the cooperative employed 300 African-American caulkers and received several government contracts. This is in 1866, 1867. Ultimately, it employed a number of white workers as well. The success of Isaac Myers Union in Baltimore encouraged African-American caulkers in other seaport cities to organize. It also caught the attention of the National Labor Union, the NLU, National Labor Union Executive Committee. Then, that, this was the largest labor organization in the nation at this time. In 1869, the National Labor Union invited Isaac Myers, Colored Caulkers Trade Union Society, to its annual convention meeting in Philadelphia. The NLU declared it would welcome African American unions into its federation. Meanwhile, Isaac Myers was elected president of the Colored National Labor Union, okay, the Colored National Labor Union, the first organization of this type in history. Isaac Myers appealed to African-American workers to join unions and called on white unions to accept them as full members. Expecting the full support of the National Labor Union, he soon learned that the predominantly white organization insisted that African-American union members abandon the Republican Party and join the Labor Reform Party. So the Republican Party at this time was the party of Lincoln. Even though Lincoln was assassinated, shot April 14th, 1865, the overwhelming majority of African Americans are Republicans at this time, okay? Because it was Republicans, you had those uh, radical Republicans during Reconstruction that are pushing for rights and, 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 and resources for, for African Americans, for, for former slaves. But the... Um, National Labor Union wants African Americans uh, as conditions of becoming members of the National Labor Union to abandon the Republican Party and join the Labor Reform Party. When African American Union members led by Isaac Myers refused to abandon the Republican Party, 
they were not invited back to the National Labor Union. There's always a catch there. There's a lot, there's a lot of notice a lot of times. There's always a catch. Now, with no allies among the larger labor movement, the colored National Labor Union soon found itself isolated and it disbanded and collapsed uh, by 1871. Isaac Myers held a variety of other positions, but his years of prominence were over. He worked as a detective for the Baltimore Police, uh, for the Baltimore Post Office between 1872 and 1879. Between 1879 and 1882, he operated a small Baltimore coal yard, C-O-A-L, coal yard. For the next five years, he worked as a U.S. government revenue officer who inspected goods for customs duty. Isaac Myers also organized a, uh, and became a president of the Maryland Colored State Industrial Fair Association, the Colored Businessmen's Association of Baltimore, the Colored Building and Loan Association, and the Aged Minister's uh, Home of the AME, African Methodist uh, Episcopal Church. He also authored the Mason's Digest. Isaac Myers uh, married twice and had several sons, one of whom became a leading political figure in Ohio. Isaac Myers died uh, in Baltimore in 1891. So blackpass.org has a good article dealing with Isaac Myers and the, and the uh, 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 Colored Caucus Trade Union Society. Uh, Isaac Myers, 1835-1891 at blackpast, P-A-S-T, blackpass.org. All right. So when we look at Labor Day celebrations, Labor Day is still celebrated in cities and towns across the United States with parades, picnics, barbecues, fireworks, displays, and other public gatherings. For many Americans, particularly children and young adults, it represents the end of summer and the start of back to school season, okay? Uh, now, in 1968, you had the Uniform Monday Holiday Act, which passed Congress and was signed into law. Um, the, it was signed, uh, signed into law by, um, yeah, it was signed into law. The Uniform Monday Holiday Act of 1968 changed several holidays to ensure they would always be observed on Mondays so that federal employees could have more three-day week, uh, three weekends. The Uniform Monday Holiday Act, signed into law on June 28, 1968, moved George Washington's birthday, Memorial Day, and Columbus Day to fix Mondays each year, okay? And um, yeah, history.com has a uh, article dealing with uh, Labor Day history, so they have uh, more information. They'll give you more background information. Um, DailyCause.com has an article from um, 2015, I think this is, Labor Day, the Labor Movement and Black Americans. Labor Day, the Labor Movement and Black Americans. DailyCause.com, K-O-S. And uh, part of the article, they uh, cite an op-ed article from the griot.com written by Theodore R. Johnson who wrote about Labor Day and, and some of the African-American roots of Labor Day. And he talked about um, the Pullman porters and how during this period, this profession of being a Pullman porter was the largest employer of African-Americans in the nation that constituted a significant portion of the Pullman company's work. Yet African-Americans were not allowed to join the Railroad, railroad Workers Union being excluded from the right to even fight for fair work and wages, the Pullman porters formed their own union called the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, the first, uh, the, the first black union, and a, and a Philip Randolph was his first president. That name should sound familiar. The first planned march on Washington was a Philip Randolph's brainchild. It was set to take place in the 1940s. This demonstration was called off weeks before its kickoff date because President uh, Franklin Roosevelt 
met with A. Philip Randolph and other civil rights leaders in 1941 and signed an, uh, an executive order barring racial discrimination in the federal defense industry. President Roosevelt did not stop the march. Uh, President Roosevelt did so to stop the march from happening. Okay, well, that was Executive Order 8802 that you've heard me talk about before. Executive Order 8802 signed June 25th, 1941 by President Roosevelt. And this, this dealt with desegregating jobs in the Department of Defense because this is um, a few months before the U.S. enters into World War II, but World War II is going on and uh, the U.S. is manufacturing uh, defense equipment for the allies. And you have a lot of uh, Department of Defense jobs that are taking place and more being created. So A. Philip Randolph threatened, threatened to put 100,000 African Americans marching on Washington to embarrass Roosevelt if he did not desegregate these jobs. Okay, so Roosevelt signs Executive Order 8802, which opened African-Americans during the great line of South up north. So a lot of our great-grandparents, a lot of our great-grandfathers are going to get these jobs in the Department of Defense, including in Detroit, okay, because the auto manufacturers are switching over from making cars to uh, building military equipment for the Allies. All right? So a lot of these jobs that our grandparents are going to get or great grandparents get came from this executive order that was pushed by a Philip Randolph. He leveraged his position with the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters to push an agenda. Okay. So we have to understand how all of this history is interconnected and intersects. All right, how's everybody doing? Okay, if you like this type of information, uh, also you can donate to the African History Network, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. This helps us to keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting. Uh, visit our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, africanhistorynetwork.com. All of my DVD lectures are there. We have bundle packs, and we have the uh, Black Migrations, uh, 1619 to 2019, uh, DVD bundle pack there also. Okay, that's a uh, six DVD bundle pack. Includes uh, six of my latest presentations. And those are presentations I've done um, in 2019. And includes also Black Migration 1619 to 2019 from the Birth of a Nation to the uh, Red Summer 1919 to the Detroit Race Ride of 1943, where I break down a lot of this history. And when we deal with 400 years in 1619 and we deal with Virginia it was actually uh, point point comfort in Hampton Virginia where those 29 Africans come in it's important to understand a few things one African people have been in this land going back tens of thousands of years this is actually our land stolen from us so if we read the first Americans were Africans documented evidence by Dr. David M. Hotep he breaks this down and I just interviewed him August 21st 2019 uh, so it's on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. It's on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. And we dealt with um, 1619 to 2019, and we dealt with the African presence in the Americas going back tens of thousands of years. Because we were here in this land before Native Americans came into existence. Now, this does not mean that the transatlantic slave trade did not happen. It just means that we have to understand tens of thousands of years of history before the transatlantic slave trade happens. Yes, the transatlantic slave trade did happen. I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'm saying we have to understand the chronology of history that leads up to it happening. All right, so um, in his new book, because uh, this book is out of print, that's why I don't take it out of the house. His new book, he said in the interview, it comes out uh, either December 2019 or January 2020. So look out for that. First Americans were Africans revisited. It'll be available at Amazon.com. All right. Um, but yeah, we have uh, my six DVD bundle pack, uh, Black Migrations, 1619 to 2019. OK, uh, that bundle. All right. We have uh, T. Foster. 
Gunjaman, Susan, just a few of the people watching. How's everybody doing? All right, so hopefully this uh, helped you get, get a better understanding of uh, Labor Day and also the African-American roots of Labor Day and the fight that we have uh, also in the labor movement and understanding uh, some of the history of the labor movement and how labor unions were originally used against African-Americans to lock us out of jobs that we have been doing for free <laughs> for, from 1619 to 1865. And I'm not against labor unions, I'm against racism within labor unions, okay? Uh, labor unions did help to create an African-American middle class, especially in the auto industry. And I live in Detroit, born and raised in Detroit. So this is Motown. So I understand that history. So I'm not against labor unions in general. I'm against racism in labor unions. And I'm against labor unions pushing African-Americans out, locking African-Americans out of opportunities or in uh, and I'm against so I'm against the racism within the labor unions. OK, they do have their purpose and they have once we were able to get in there and gain employment and get decent wages, they did help create a African-American middle class. OK. All right. Erica, how you doing, Erica? All right, guys. So I wanted to do, you know, I originally I wanted to do this broadcast on. Um, Labor Day, but I was so busy, didn't have a chance to do that. And I've been traveling in and out of town. And um, I wanted to do this uh, at our regularly scheduled time, 9 p.m. Sunday. But since I was in uh, Pembroke, Illinois, Friday, we had to do it later on Sunday. All right. So listen to the African History Network show Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we broadcast here on Facebook Live and broadcast on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation. I think next Sunday we'll be in the radio uh, station studio think they will not be preempting my show. Um, follow us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network. Also on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. And uh, African American business owners, be sure to email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com, customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. We'll let you know how you can uh, advertise with the African History Network. Uh, we... Uh, promote your business during our live broadcasts, and uh, we put these on our YouTube channel also. And then uh, we also put these broadcasts in audio podcast format, and also our Sunday night show, the African History Network show, is uh, in audio podcast format on eight different podcast platforms. So we're on Acast, uh, we're on um, iTunes, Castbox, Stitcher, Acast, FM Player, TuneIn, and some other podcast platforms also. So we take your 30 second and 60 second commercial and put it into the uh, audio podcast of our various broadcasts. If you don't have a commercial, we can record one for you. Our current promotion, get three months for the price of one. We have a special promotion uh, uh, that we have running for a few more days. Uh, get three months for the price of one. Email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. And uh, we can get you uh, started today. All right. Theprofitroom.com. Theprofitroom.com uh, can help you if you want to learn about the stock market, learn about trading, learn about investing. They are an education company that has mentorship programs that are designed for beginners like yourself. They teach individuals like you how to create generational wealth through trading and investing in the financial markets. So you can learn about stocks, options, futures, the foreign exchange market. Their specialty is day trading, and they also offer one-on-one -on -one mentorship. Visit their website, theprofitroom.com, theprofitroom.com, and click on Wealth Building. Let them know you found out about this from the African History Network. All right, guys. Hey, look, we have to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct your own behavior, what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. Remember, people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. A people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past 
in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community community. Right now let's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win for Wakanda forever. And we'll talk to you all next time. Peace.